morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Sarah Sivan. Uh, it is uh, indeed uh, a great pleasure. It's kind of very warm and empty. We are aware of the fact that you have a very tightly packed schedule, and despite that, you are here amongst us today. And uh, that is a great pleasure, and it will be nice hearing you for the day's proceedings. We also would like to welcome uh, Ms. Nisa Biswan. We met her two months back. She is the U.S. Assistant Secretary for South Asia and Central Asia. And has very nice uh, uh, interaction with her there. And uh, so that carried on this morning. And I don't think our question and answers are finished yet. But coming back to the uh, chief guest of the day, Dr. Uh, Sarwal, I will only mention uh, two, three things about her. That firstly, uh, okay. she has uh, taken over as the U.S. Undersecretary for Civil and Security, Democracy, Human Rights on February 20th, 2014. And uh, she will speak to us on democratic values and violent extremism. And this is a very difficult subject once again because violence and the uh, democracy all don't seem to gel with each other at all. And it's not an easy subject to handle. As far as the background is concerned, just two things. Uh, she has uh, been uh, at the Howard Kennedy School and uh, also the Center for Human Rights Policy and directed the program for national security and human rights. And there's another program with which she was very really intimately involved, and that was Mass Atrocities Response Operation Project to assist the U.S. military and with contingency planning to protect civilians from large-scale violence. Now, I will uh, mention to her that uh, we have, of course, all kinds of uh, militant groups all around us. We have in our immediate neighborhood in Pakistan, a certain amount of very violent level of, uh, the groups which are active. We have LAP, we have uh, JASH, and there are a few other smaller groups. And so you have in Afghanistan, Taliban, and now the name which is really doing the second is the ISIS, and uh, our DASH. And now there's the news that uh, there are already fingerprints of them in Afghanistan. So, and these people uh, in Afghanistan, uh, who have arrived with that people, they have built up their, uh, they have protected themselves so attractively to the entire world element. As a matter of fact, they have created a kind of a romanticism about their entire uh, existence. And by the use of the social media in a very, very big way. And uh, in all kinds, they have used their Twitter, they are on the Facebook, they are on the, uh, on every kind of thing which you think of. So they have made a big name for themselves. And uh, recently we had uh, an interaction with the Maryland University, uh, with the US Embassy who are here, with whom we have very good interaction and support we have from them, and uh, the Facebook. And we discussed the subject at length. And it was felt that all these people and uh, the social media also will have to shoulder a certain amount of responsibility to make sure that organizations like this do not get an advantage by the unfair use of social media. Anyway, to, uh, I think not to eat into your time because you have to leave at 12. We much rather like to listen to you. So we will invite uh, Dr. Sarah to uh, speak to us on this morning subject. So all to her. Thank you. the Vaikanunda International Foundation for inviting me to speak with you here today. I know that the foundation has been such an extraordinary partner for our embassy, and we're very grateful. Um, so, Bahat Dan Nyawwa, So, as the general mentioned, my name is Sarah Sewell. I serve at the United States State Department as the Undersecretary for Civilian Security. What that means 
is that um, my undersecretariat is responsible for a range of functional issues all the way from counterterrorism to human rights. And so I have the extraordinary privilege and challenge of trying to understand both the tensions and the synergies uh, between those two uh, very critical issues for both of our nations. And if we look back over the just last year of friendship between India and the United States, we see a great deal to celebrate. Our two countries launched a new strategic and commercial dialogue, and we held the first ever dialogue on UN and multilateral issues. We forged a landmark agreement to reduce the threat of global climate change. Um, and this time last year, you honored our country by hosting President Obama as your chief guest in the Republic Day Parade. Secretary Kerry has said of U.S.-India relations, we have entered a new era. When President Obama lights the dia in the White House to celebrate Diwali, when the First Lady shakes her shoulders to Bhangra uh, with children in Mumbai, and when Prime Minister Modi draws a crowd of 18,000 cheering Americans in New York's Madison Square Garden, we know that something is changing. If the ties between our two countries are growing stronger, the ties between our governments are growing stronger, the ties between our societies, our economies, our histories, and our core values have always been close. As you all know, Vivekananda helped set that in motion when he traveled to Chicago over 120 years ago to introduce Hindu philosophy to America. And I understand that his birthday was just yesterday, so it's especially fitting that we take stock of the common ties that we have built since that time. Today, the United States boasts the largest and most successful Indian diaspora in the world. Indians lead our top companies like Google and Microsoft. They're responsible for an astonishing 15% of all startups in Silicon Valley. These individuals serve in some of the highest positions in government, and they rank among our very best artists, writers, and entertainers, from Nora Jones to Jhumpa Lahiri to Aziz Ansari. Annual trade between India and the United States has grown to over $100 billion, and we all know those top lines about the relationship. But the reality is that the foundation on which that relationship is built is far deeper. Our countries share a common story. Both of our nations cast off colonialism and embraced the power of everyday people, of citizens, to chart their own destiny. We've built vibrant democracies where all groups, regardless of their gender, race, religion, or class, have equal rights under the law. Both of our constitutions begin with the same three words, we the people. Similarly, diversity is fundamental to both of our national identities, and it gives us a vitality and a resilience that few other nations enjoy. We protect the rights of Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Jains, Sikhs, and others, and we celebrate them as inseparable parts of our national family, or as, as Gandhi once said, as branches of the same majestic tree. More than our summits, and our dialogues more than our trade and our commerce. It is this shared history and common values that bind our nations together in a deepening partnership. We have also, sadly, been brought together by the shared trauma of terrorism, from the attacks against the United States on 9-11, to the attacks against Mumbai on 26-11, and to the more recent bloodshed in Puthankot early this year. We strongly condemn these attacks and we express our deepest condolences to the victims and to their families. We recognize that terror is all too often on India's doorstep. That's why we're strengthening counterterrorism cooperation across the board, which Secretary Kerry and Minister Swaruj detailed last September in the U.S.-India Joint Declaration on Combating Terrorism. From expanding intelligence sharing to cracking down on illicit terrorist finance, better securing our borders, ports, and public transportation, 
and helping to train thousands of Indian security personnel, the United States stands shoulder to shoulder with India and all countries in the region against the threat of extremism. And we will continue to press Pakistan to take the fight to all terrorist networks in the border region and to do everything in its power to help India achieve justice for the Mumbai attacks, which claims both Indian and American lives. That is what partners do. We help each other overcome shared challenges. And that's what I want to do today in that spirit, is to speak openly and honestly as partners and as friends about a common challenge that both of our nations face. India and the United States, both free, inclusive, and democratic societies, face a similar test in working to overcome the threat of terrorism while staying true to our most fundamental and cherished values. The persistence of terrorism and the rise of groups like ISIL or Daesh underscore the limits of the conventional approaches and tools we have used to fight this challenge. We need a broader, bolder, and smarter approach to turn terrorism back. An approach that goes beyond countering terrorists with our military intelligence and law enforcement tools, although those remain absolutely vital to the challenge, but they go beyond that to also preventing people from becoming terrorists in the first place. It's only then that we can ensure the terrorists that we eliminate are not simply replaced by others. And that's how we reduce the threat over the long term to enable sustainable progress in what is unfortunately a generational struggle. How do we do that? It begins with addressing the forces that radicalize individuals to join violent extremist movements. These include desire for belonging, perceptions of injustice and abuse, corruption and neglect, discrimination and marginalization. All of these factors can create fertile soil for violent ideologies to take root. And in the global age, as the general mentioned, Digital platforms and the free flow of people and goods make it easier than ever for extremists to infiltrate our communities with hateful messages and false promises of fulfillment, of shadowy recruiters, and how-to manuals for mass terror. Over time, this intersection of grievances and violent ideology can transform our neighbors, our brothers, and our sisters, our children, into killers prepared to turn on their communities. And so when I say that traditional security tools, soldiers and surveillance, wiretaps and police, cannot alone effectively counteract this process, I am simply describing a reality. Success in the fight against violent extremism and terrorism requires a broader whole of society approach. This was, of course, the central message in last February's White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism, or CBE. And at this summit, India and the United States stood with representatives from foreign governments, multilateral bodies, and civil society to galvanize global action behind a broader and more preventive approach to violent extremism. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has reinforced that message just this past week when he released the United Nations Comprehensive Plan of Action on Preventing Violent Extremism. The comprehensive CVE approach calls for partnerships at every level between government and civil society. Public officials, of course, play a critical role by governing effectively, inclusively, and upholding the rule of law which limits the grievances that violent extremists can exploit, such as corruption, abuse, and discrimination. But this broader approach to CVE recognizes that any nation's ability to challenge violent extremism also inherently relies on local leaders, on businesses, on academics, on women, on youth, and on the faith community to step up and push back against the hateful ideologies and to promote messages of peace. Across the globe, local leaders are stepping up to do just that. Youth activists in Uganda, Somalia, and the Philippines 
are challenging terrorist propaganda targeting their peers. Researchers, researchers from all across the world have launched a new Resolve network to share their findings about the local drivers of violent extremism. And I hope that this foundation is able to become involved by contributing its own scholarship to that global effort. Mayors and other local leaders from every region have launched the Strong Cities Network to help each other build local resilience to violent extremism. Mumbai was one of the founding members of this network, and I encourage Delhi and other communities across India to join this network as well. Many partners could benefit from learning more about India's examples of tolerance and resilience in the face of terror. And they would also benefit from hearing about the countless leaders outside government confronting violent extremism in communities across India. For example, when extremists murdered Malashapa Kalburji last August to silence his critical views, it was the third such murder in as many years, as you well know, the Indian literary and artistic community was among the first to condemn the act. And just south of here, in the Miwat district, activist Archana Kapoor set up several mother's schools to give women the skills to detect and the self-confidence to challenge radicalization to violence in their communities and within their families. While women are excluded from the matters of security all too often, they are often best positioned to identify and address radicalization to violence among family members. And of course, religious leaders are among the most critical actors in pushing back against violent extremism. They can teach curious young minds the tenets of faith and refute extremist interpretations that exalt violence. They're also well positioned to intervene to walk someone back from the path of radicalization. From their vantage point in the community, faith leaders can also help government identify and address the local drivers of radicalization, like perceptions of government neglect and police abuse. So across India, from Kerala to Kashmir, faith communities are mobilizing to challenge violent extremism. One and a half million Muslims from the regions gathered in Uttar Pradesh last month to reject global terrorism and affirm the Holy Quran's injunction that, quote, killing one innocent person is equivalent to killing all humanity. And more than 70,000 clerics from around the world gathered in Burili to condemn ISIL as inhuman and un-Islamic. And in Delhi, students at a local college lit candles to outshine ISIL's darkness as Muslim women raised their voices to decry ISIL for carrying out such inhuman acts in the name of Allah. Now all of these voices, moms and imams alike, are essential to building the critical mass of influence needed to discredit violent extremism within our communities. These examples of family and community-led interventions may help explain why so few Indians have joined ISIL's ranks thus far. But it's not a reason for complacency, it's a call to give local leaders an even greater role in pushing back against violent extremism in their communities. Governments can help by ending stifling regulations on civil society and by allowing citizen groups to peacefully speak and organize around sensitive topics. Government can give civil society a real seat at the table in policy development and ensure that civil society members have access to the resources and information that they need to fully contribute. This is fundamental to the entire whole of society CVE effort. It's really a fundamental conclusion of the White House summit on countering violent extremism. Of course, governments, and this is something that our government also is wrestling with, must go a step further by proactively reaching out to build ties with those communities that have been targeted by violent extremists for recruitment. Like Maharushka, where local police are partnering with local clerics to de-radicalize de youth. Local officials can also support civil society with resources, expertise, and coordination. For example, governments can train leaders to use, state leaders to use communications platforms to dramatically expand their outreach. And governments can help connect a local group with a national or an international counterpart to learn from each other's works along the lines of the networks that have recently been launched flowing from the White House summit. Governments can provide funding to, direct, to amplify the impact 
of those groups that are most vital to the fight against extremism. But more broadly, and most importantly, governments must ensure that all people experience the freedom to peacefully speak, organize, and worship. The protection of rights is central to the battle against violent extremism. Our own national experiences from the history of white supremacists in the United States to Maoist extremists here in India show us that no religion, no political ideology is immune to violent extremism. We must um, know that laws alone can't guarantee the freedom and security that we seek. We have to challenge the underlying assumptions, and leaders in particular have to speak out with, with challenging direct and indirect calls for hatred, division, and violence. Where extremism explodes, as in the lynching of a Muslim man last September or in the burning of churches in Orissa, public figures must be quick to <coughs> condemn those acts and the misguided beliefs that are used to justify such violence. Learning from the past, we must also, in our battles against violent extremism, avoid the traps of justifying bigotry, profiling, and discrimination against any single religious or ethnic group, including our Muslim brothers and sisters. Because that defies not only our deepest values, but it strengthens the lie that groups like ISIL tell. Lies that democracies somehow are incompatible with Islam. <coughs> In the United States, we've gone to court and won to defend the right of Muslim women to wear the hijab. In a time of heightened anxiety following the attacks in San Bernardino and elsewhere, our Secretary of Education sent a letter to every principal in America to ensure that students of all backgrounds feel safe and respected. When a teacher mistook a Muslim student science project for a bomb and sent him to the police, President Obama responded by welcoming the young man to the White House. And in an address to the nation following the terrorist attack in California, President Obama reminded the country that Muslim Americans are our neighbors, our co-workers, our sports heroes, and soldiers on the front lines. Here in India, the history of Islam is nearly as old as the faith itself. More than 170 million Indian Muslims live alongside Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, Sikhs, and Jains. And when some voices openly worry that Indian Muslims would be swayed by ISIL's propaganda, Home Minister Singh responded by calling India's Muslims patriots and by praising the country's diversity as an enduring strength. That is the kind of leadership from public officials that we need to see more of around the world. Leadership in the spirit of Nehru, who famously ran headfirst into violent mobs to urge tolerance amidst the furies of partition. Let's be honest. Violent extremists want a clash of civilizations. Throughout history, they have sought to divide and to demonize. But the success and the prosperity of societies like ours, free, diverse, and enriched by the contributions of all, fly in the face of everything that violent extremists believe. And as we face violent extremists, we must reject their terms of engagement and stay true to ourselves by upholding religious freedom, ensuring legal protection for all, and speaking out immediately against discrimination and hatred of all stripes. India and the United States are great partners and global leaders. The choices we make domestically, the examples that we set, will influence the world in profound ways. So let us continue to show the world that as we bring justice to terror groups like Daesh, we can prevent the next generation of threat from emerging by empowering our communities, embracing our diversity, and staying true to our shared and common values. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's open to the questions.
Excuse me. Okay, thank you for a wonderful exposure on this. My question pertains to the uh, democratic values, which are not ingrained in a particular nation, and we try to explain to them these values and do, do not accept it in a manner that we thought they would. And thereby we also not stabilize them enough by way of their basic institutions that they are able to absorb it and we need. It creates a lot of vacuum and that probably is the reason why we see the kind of turmoil which is on presently and other nations are feeling a similar threat. Unless the country is institutionally strong like India is, we have got our basic institutions well in place for centuries. Therefore, we are less vulnerable and it appears. But over a period of time, these institutions are likely to be weakening themselves due to the pressure of the extremism. It is a typical case of tail dragging the dog rather than other way around. Could you kindly explain as to how these values and extremism gets linked in this manner where we leave a vacuum and we try to export this democratic values? Thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> Are you more interested in how uh, the, the institutions within our two countries are challenged over time by responses to violent extremism, or are you asking a question fundamentally about other nations? Other nations. So thank you. The, um, your point is very well taken, that for nations such as ours, which have long democratic histories and strong institutions, the tensions that are ultimately arise as, as governments and peoples seek to address violent extremism while upholding their values, it's much more difficult for states that have weak institutions. And I think that's one of the huge opportunities that exist for the United States and India because of the position of privilege, if you will, that we enjoy with strong institutions to work in close partnership with states in which um, those institutions are not as strong. I think there is no magic bullet for institution strengthening but I think what is, has been proven to be critically important are the voices that have learned the costs of intolerance, the costs of short-term accommodations for political advantage or for riding out an immediate crisis at the expense of the longer-term strength and harmony and peace and prosperity within countries. So, for example, as we think about uh, a state uh, whether it is in Afghanistan or a Bangladesh, helping those leaders understand their responsibilities to, um, to resist short-term exigencies and work on longer-term security goals by being inclusive, by being supportive of the rule of law, and by defending the importance of those as national security strengths in the long term to help educate a population that may be less understanding of those connections, those are, are the opportunities that exist for states such as ours to play a positive role in states where institutions are weaker. So there is no, there is no easy answer for the problem that you rightly point out, but I think it is part of the reason why the United States and India in many, um, in many areas have a really important uh, stabilizing and mentoring role because of our own experience. And I think it's one of the, the, the topics that will be on the agenda in my discussions here in Delhi is finding ways to increase our ability to work together and do just that. Can you identify yourself? I will do that. Uh, I'm deeply saying uh, I have been a public servant and, uh, and, and an author. I thank you, Sarah, <coughs> for your excellent presentation. I have studied the subject rather deeply, and I have written a book called Bahudhar in the post 9 11 world, published in Oxford University Press. I hold the view that civilizations don't clash, savagery does. I also hold the view that in the long run, that realization will come if democratic values become universal. And for that, we have to take a series of measures. First was the question of religion being redefined, re-evaluated. You can't uh, 
Pali religion has uh, not conducive to peace. You talk about the rule of law, and the rule of law in the global affairs must conform to the UN Charter. So when a country violates that, it is violation of the rule of law, as it happens in national So I have developed a theory called the Bahudha approach, which means Bahudha is pluralism in English, but it is more than pluralism. It says that while I have a point of view, I must hear you with respect that you may perhaps be right. And that celebration of diversity requires giving education a good role. Uh, students must be taught to respect others. And therefore, redefining religions, programming education properly, <coughs> using force in terms of the UN Charter, and assuming collective responsibility. These are the things you know, countries are using violent groups, jihadi groups, to promote their own national goals. And it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, it's not confined to one country, but to a number of countries. So we are trying to not face the problem. By, as they put it, we have to catch the bull by the horn. And uh, we look up to you uh, to make these issues in general to the U.S. policy and also uh, we should also make this as integral to the Indian policy. Fortunately, these two countries are doing that, but more needs to be done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I will change direction, come back. You are here, right? My business. Does it does it introduce yourself, everybody? Uh, uh, my name is Albay. I work here in BIF and look after ISIS. I have come across a fantastic study carried out by the George Washington University recently on ISIS. It's called From Retweets to Raqqa. And the study has categorized a large number of uh, teams. And one of the things that caught my attention is the role of the converts uh, within the uh, within within the U.S. who are supporting the ISIS, and from the role of the Muslim converts uh, who are supporting the ISIS within the United States, and from from March 2014 till about uh, November 2015, uh, there have there have been about 77 arrests, and most of them have been arrested from the airports, and they happen to be the converts. So when you talk about these democratic values, which the U.S. heralds, why, why, why is this problem like on the rise from the Muslim converts, and why are they getting more attracted to this sort of violence? And your response to the uh, threat from the lone wolf, which is going to be lone wolves, which is going to be a major challenge to the U.S. counterterrorism. Thank you. You're absolutely right, and it's it's really interesting in the context of. Um, the domestic debate within the United States, how few people seem to understand that, um, that individuals are vulnerable to being recruited by violent ideology regardless of their religious backgrounds. So the fact that we have had an increasing number of converts to Islam from non-Islamic uh, backgrounds suggests that there is a search and a hunger and a series of motivations um, that make people vulnerable to violent ideology, regardless of their own religious faith. And I think that is something that uh, is a very important point to be made, particularly in the context of public discussions about uh, faiths as being um, of a particular character or another. The US challenge is to identify the communities and uh, individuals who are most at risk for this uh, radicalization. This is something that's very difficult to do, particularly in a society that is as diverse as our own. It's part of the reason why we have 
really focused on building ties within the United States, not simply at the national level with civil society organizations, <coughs> but at the very local level with community leaders. Because it, it can be very difficult to uh, detect the signs of radicalization in individuals. Um, I think we've seen this in some recent cases. So we will have an ongoing challenge uh, in the United States, as does uh, virtually any nation across the globe, with disillusioned individuals who are at risk of um, becoming um, seduced by the extremist propaganda that is so readily available online uh, today. This is part of the reason why the United States is eager to share lessons with other countries who are similarly grappling with radicalization and recruitment uh, within their own borders. Because the ability to, to predict who will become radicalized, when and why, is something that has escaped uh, virtually every government around the globe. And the need to engage communities in detecting the early signs of radicalization <laughs> and to develop best practices to build trust between local communities and local government officials so that interventions can occur early before violent action is taken or before people flee the country to go join battlefields abroad is really the, um, the best investment that we can make in terms of preventing violence among those who are at risk of radicalization. But the fundamental point that I want to I wanna thank you for raising is that it is, um, it speaks to the importance of not branding any particular religious group as being um, a, a source of destabilization because it is the extremist ideology, not the religion per se, that is problematic. Yeah, okay. Yes, your turn. I'll come back to you. Oh. Are the lady of the back? Um, I'm Archana Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saras, even about mentioning our work in your speech. Thank you so much. It's just a drop in the ocean. There's a long uh, way to go. Um, I totally, I just a comment and then a question that uh, what you said is absolutely right. We need to work with communities and we need to um, use women because, you know, they are the ones who understand. They understand the early warning signals. They work very closely. They are all the time spending time with their children. So I think they are the best place to understand and uh, identify the change in behavior. And I think that is something that we really need to build on and empower women uh, with these skills and try to take it you know, further. And give them a platform where they can address these grievances and where they can talk about them and they can share them without fear. But having said that, you said that a lot of countries are doing and so uh, is US involved in working with communities. It would be really interesting if we could have a common platform where we can share our best practices. Because right now we are all working in our little silos and we don't know what is working where. I'm saying that everything is cultural and contextual, but still there's a lot which can be shared and which can be learned and we may not be making the same mistakes or not trying to reinvent the wheel. So it would be brilliant if we could have some kind of platform which is created where we can learn from each other. So, Thank you for that. We. Um, I couldn't agree more. I think there is, um, coming out of the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism, three global platforms were created. All of them are relevant, although not explicitly designed for the role of women per se. But I think that we, we, we must think about, about using and developing the platforms that we are already building um, as a global community. So the research network, the resolve network, the youth network, um, and I think particularly apposite for the work that you are doing is this, the Strong Cities Network. And there again, were Delhi to become a member of that network, um, that would provide exactly such a platform for linking many of the disparate elements of civil society that are working on different angles of the prevention work together with your, uh, your counterparts internationally. And so um, I would, I would urge you to, to see to what extent the existing platforms can be useful to you because I, I, this problem is not going away, the challenge is not going away, borders are almost immaterial in this conversation and th therefore we have to think about uh, developing the truly cross-cutting and enduring um, 
mechanisms for empowering more and more people to become part of the solution of the prevention challenge. So thank you for raising the point. Uh, thank you. I got you. I'm Vijay Naik. I'm a journalist. Uh, Madam, I just want to quote Mr. Obama in his union speech yesterday, which he says, Pakistan may become safe haven for new terrorist networks. They talk of long instability in Pakistan. In such a situation, arming Pakistan continuously, how does it help the global receive fight against terrorism? Because we find the arms are coming and the aid is coming to Pakistan from America continuously. So how it is going to help? And you also know that Mr. Tony Blair had confessed recently that it was because of the aggression of the Iraq that the creation of ISIS had taken place. Please, your views. So my views are that the United States is concerned about the development of violent extremism everywhere that it is developing, to include <coughs> Pakistan among many, um, many different countries in, in the region and across the globe. And the United States is firmly committed, as it has um, made clear in a variety of UN fora as well as regional fora, to doing everything that it can to prevent the flows of financing and assistance of other forms to terror networks worldwide. It's one of the reasons why we were among the founding members of the Global Counterterrorism Forum. It's one of the reasons why we have worked to support UN Security Council Res Resolution 2178 <coughs> about uh, foreign terrorist fighters. It, it describes many of the different initiatives that the United States has taken in addition to our role and our commitment and our contributions to the fight against Daesh. So the U.S. commitment is, um, is clear and enduring, and I think it has been something that has helped to galvanize global efforts in greater coordination and effectiveness. And having said that, the threats are, um, are very challenging. They uh, occur in uh, small tendrils across the globe, and they do not lend themselves to, to singular solutions. And so this is the, the, the spread of terrorist activity, the prevention of safe havens, is something that is not unique to any one nation, and it's not unique to this moment in time. It will be with us for some time. It's part of the reason why President Obama is so committed to ensuring that the, the, the global fight is joined. The Secretary General's preventive plan of action is, I think, a critical evolution in the role of the United Nations as recognizing the, the need to bring community-based solutions and non-military tools to the prevention agenda to prevent the next generation of terrorists from emerging. In the medium term, we have counterterrorism efforts that are continuing globally. But the, the question that you raise is part of a larger conundrum, and it will occupy us for some time. It's the reason we believe that global partnerships are so important, and it's the reason why we believe that we have to start now focusing more on the prevention aspects because the problem cannot continue to grow or it will overwhelm us as a global and international community dedicated to the values of tolerance and rule of law and prosperity and sovereignty. And so um, this, is, this is an area in which we welcome India's partnership, we welcome the partnership of, of many leading nations across the globe. And um, we have to continue, and part of the reason for my visit here is to continue to deepen the ties from those, among those who share this view. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Tamar. I'm with Reuters here in New Delhi. Uh, I had a couple of questions specifically about um, the recent incident in Punjab. Um, after the attack on the base in Punjab, India shared what it called actionable intelligence with Pakistan regarding the fact that the attackers came from Pakistan. And I was wondering whether you and the U.S. had a uh, take on whether there was such, whether you were satisfied with Pakistan's response <coughs> to that and investigation into those leads. Um, my second question is also related to the fact that both that event and an attack on the Indian consulate in Mazar in Afghanistan were both attributed to the same group, Jaish e Mohammed. Um, I wanted to know whether you, what message you felt that the perpetrators of those attacks were sending at this particular moment, and what is the correct response to that? And, attack on regional stability right now. So let me um, let me start with your second question first, if I could, which is that I don't want to dignify acts of violence with any message. Um, and to your first question, I think this is an issue that has been of great concern to the President and to the Secretary. Uh, both have invested 
uh, personally in conveying both our condolences to the Indian government, but also the, the sense of urgency and concern that we have directly to the Pakistan government. And we will continue to do everything that we can to press for immediate action. Having said that, one of the things that we have learned over time is that it's absolutely critical <coughs> to get the facts straight and to be confident that the rule of law is being fully followed. So we will continue to push for action uh, consistent with the facts. And um, <coughs> it, is, uh, it is absolutely essential, as I said in the, in the speech, that Pakistan take action against every group that is perpetrating violence. And we have made this clear at the highest levels of government. We will continue to press and make this clear uh, until we are satisfied that action is being taken. Hello. My name is Sarur Turabi and I'm from Shia community. Um, I have one question from where exactly this violent extremism come from. Like the Muslim organizations, those are part in this terrorist uh, activities, they are using one word called jihad. And we have two jihads in Islam. One is jihad with sword, one is jihad with, with will. Uh, after, uh, if, you, if you see the life of the Prophet, like he approximately he did 83, 83 or 84 wars in his life. And uh, 83 or 84 wars, that is jihad will, he did jihad will self, like with sword. And after the Prophet in Islam, we have two sects. In one sect, jihad in sword is not there. So the core problem is this, the misunderstanding of Islam. The people who are using the word jihad for violent extremism, they are exactly not understanding Islam. So I just, uh, I just have one solution. If the Muslim clergy, the Muslim leadership, and the great country like India and United States will aware the Muslim community and besides Muslim community, all other communities also, that what is right Islam? The right Islam never tells about to do jihad for self. Thanks. I'll just make a brief comment. I mean, first of all, the President, President Obama agrees with you 100%. He makes this point time and time again. And it's one of the reasons why the White House Summit emphasized the need for um, for religious voices to find a way to better engage those who could be misled by um, by extremists who, who who mangle and manipulate uh, the word uh, of theology. Um, but it also gets to the point raised by an earlier questioner, which is that those who are newest to a religion particularly those who are in the process of conversion, are perhaps most vulnerable to being um, misinformed about fundamental tenets. And so um, one of, the, one of the, the difficulties for governments is that we wish to enable and support independent religious voices to speak to these questions. And it gets back to the point about platforms, is that this is not something that most governments are best equipped to do. It really is something that um, that imams and, and religious institutions are best equipped to do. And so the role for government is to make sure that they have the freedom to do that and to support them uh, indirectly uh, in an independent role to communicate more broadly. Because uh, in a world that's saturated with a lot of misinformation, um, the best response and the most effective and sustainable response is to, to oversaturate with the truth. And, and that is a challenge that governments can't do in a, in a moment, but I, I, President Obama agrees with you 100% that this is a huge opportunity that exists in the preventive realm uh, for us to encourage going forward. Okay, last two questions. Yeah, Dr. Sayas, you want thank you very much for attending the exposure on this democratic values for the extreme. There are two components which are as different as these from Violent extremism is, is a youthful or parallel. Democratic values can be cherished, emulated, practiced by those civilized societies and countries which believe in democracy. If you look around, the terrorism is coming from those 
and trees which are called the totalitarian regimes, where there is no harmless. They have a different ideology. It may not be linked to any religion per se, but the very nature of the regime is the one which is the fountain head of this spirit of the How do you fight those people who don't even have any value understanding the basic democratic values? How do you respond to that? Because in our immediate neighborhood, as many as any number of these groups are marauding, operating, and they are infringing on our democratic values. That we as a democratic sovereign country, we are trying to family cherish, but they are being infringed upon. Time and again we are being attacked. Is the time not come where globally we mount a counter attack? By whatever means, military or otherwise, and bring them to a point where they can see what they are doing ideologically is not right. It's not humane. Otherwise, we will continue to have Mumbai, Anpur, Inanaka, and whatever with. Although this morning your president did say America is not under any threat from IS. That's what he said this morning when he was making the address to the nation. But no country is without the threat of ISIS or because one person can also cause as much damage as probably a division of the I would request your views as to how do you deal with such people who don't even understand democracy. They have no idea. They come from a different ideology, from a different regime. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me try to unpack your um, comment and question uh, slightly and return to some of the themes that I struck earlier. Um, first of all, I think one of the one of the important things to acknowledge is that the, the threats of violent extremism that we face now are not purely state-sponsored. They exist outside of states as well, um, and that makes the challenge more difficult. Uh, secondly, I think that the, the reality that we have learned in the United States uh, is that military tools alone, um, while attractive and in many cases necessary to defeat active terror threats, um, are not the singular answer, and that uh, a broader set of interventions is necessary to prevent the threat from continuing to grow such that it overwhelms our military ability to respond. And so that's the, the preventive agenda um, that really has emerged uh, from the White House Summit in February 15 and now um, evolved into the UN Prevention Plan of Action. And then thirdly, um, whenever I hear by any means necessary, I get a little bit nervous because really the, the reality is that um, is that we exist in part, that, that states that do uphold the rule of law and democratic values exist in part to uphold uh, the rule of law and, and democratic values. And so it is, it is how to defeat current threats and how to prevent the emergence of future threats while maintaining uh, our values and the rule of law that I think is such a challenge. The US experience has been one in which um, it makes us very sympathetic to many of our partners around the globe because it's one in which when um, we experienced a mass terror attack, we adopted um, many measures that relied um, most heavily on the military side and then in many cases created huge internal debate about whether they were consistent with their democratic principles. And over time we have come to find a more sustainable balance between our constitution and our, our democratic values and a strong uh, fight against violent extremism. And so I think my view is that, that while we are certainly imperfect and need to continue to learn from others and particularly need to work together with others, 
uh, in this this critical balancing act uh, that this is this is very much a stronger footing for us to be on, both more sustainable and more effective in the long run. So that's my view. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really. In the civil war, which is going on in uh, Islam, between proponents of the seventh century practices and those who want to realign the religion with the 21st century, how productive or unproductive is outside intervention? So, that's a very good question. Um, and clearly, the, to the extent that there is an ideological struggle within faiths, this is not an issue in which uh, any given state is best positioned to intervene, let alone one that does, is not a party to um, the, the, the exclusive faith conversation by virtue of its constitution or its history. Um, having said that, the, the reality is that violent extremism comes <coughs> in many different forms. We've seen violent extremism uh, come uh, arrive in in Burma in ways that were unexpected. We see violent extremism arrive in the United States in ways that have uh, racial overtones and speak to a part of our past that we are still reckoning with. We see violent extremism emerge in a variety of ways. And um, as I'm sure many in this room would agree, the role of the state in providing security to its citizens does not absolve it as the, of the responsibility to, um, to seek to protect its citizens from active threats. So the United States perspective is one in which we will continue to work to defend citizens and the international community from active threats that would be destructive of either of those two um, entities, while um, not as a matter of principle, in part because we have very strict separation of church and state within the US system, engaging in an internal debate. It is about, about the direction of a faith. We do believe that when, um, when faith leaders are free to communicate the facts, that people will understand uh, where their best interests lie and where their humanity lies. Um, but I quite take your point that, the, that a, an internal theological dispute is not one that lends itself to a secular state's engagement. OK, the last question. Last question of the day. Hi, I'm Shivani, I'm a journalist. Uh, Ma'am, for uh, you said you talked about how US used uh, you know military action after being attacked. And India now is being targeted since quite some time. And we have been pressured by the you know global community in fact to talk to Pakistan to you know use diplomatic ties and not use the military action against that particular institution. Now it is common knowledge that uh, a particular uh, government is not powerful enough. It is a weak institution and there are other even elements of uh, you know, violent extremism involved in the government. So how, for how long do you think India should continue uh, with you know, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic ties? Uh, shouldn't it take military action? Uh, should it continue to be you know, foreign security talks or the civilian talks that we do on the diplomatic level? For how long should we continue to you know, suffer? Because US took military action and after that we could see the results because there has been no uh, you know, acts of terror on, home, on the home ground. But India continues to suffer from that. So that's the first question. How do you deal with that? How do you We've got a lot of assumptions in even your first question. So maybe I should just start there. Um, so the United States would not say that it has not, and has not experienced terrorism um, since 9-11. Um, our view would be somewhat different. But to the, the question about, the, I think there are two different elements of your question. I think to the question about military action, one of the questions we learned that we have to ask ourselves is, when is military action useful? Do you have a, a, um, a target that if you were able to destroy it, would make a fundamental and lasting contribution to your security? This is one of the most difficult elements of the fight against violent extremism, is that often that kind of military satisfaction is elusive. And so I think there are really important questions for any state to ask itself as it thinks about using military tools. 
think one of the different characteristics about Daesh is that in, in the occupying of territory and in the imprisonment of people and in the, the acting more like an insurgent group where they have, they have continued to hold and, and, and nominally seek to create a state with all of its institutions and has provided such a target. Um, but that's not often the case with terror actors. And that's why in many cases we've really been looking to leadership strikes, and that's a whole different kettle of fish. We won't get into that here. Um, but I think the broader question about, about engagement, you know, President Obama's view has been that, um, and he has executed this view as a matter of US policy in, in many different contexts, that dialogue is a useful tool. And so we applaud the efforts that the Indian government has made to uh, both open and sustain dialogue. Um, that's different from achieving satisfaction on all of your policy goals. And so I think, I think that the, the wisdom of, of Indian decisions to keep dialogue open and to seek to build dialogue is a completely separate question from the satisfaction that it receives in terms of being able to protect its citizens. And I, I am confident that, that with careful thought and with the benefit of hindsight and some of the lessons that we've learned, that state leaders can differentiate between the use of military force and the um, continuing communication with those um, those that are important for uh, its own security. So uh, the second question is uh, in Malda, it's in West Bengal in India. Uh, violent extremism took place. Usually, first it was given uh, the angle of the communal angle, but later on, the information flowed in that in fact uh, military elements were involved, militants were involved from Bangladesh. So how does the state deal with uh, you know, a situation when uh, you know, violent extremism is given a uh, disguise of you know, communal anger? So how do you deal with that? How does the state deal with that situation? Is it terrorism or is it communal uh, violence? One of the reasons why I think the, the responsibility of political leaders looms so large in countries with diverse and free populations is that it can be very easy for uh, communal sensitivities to be exploited by people uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, some may be uh, violent extremist ideology, some may be more immediate political gain. There are all kinds of risks when you have uh, diverse and free speaking societies, and we certainly have experienced that. Uh, it's part of the reason why I think um, President Obama and many US presidents uh, before them uh, have sought to speak out early and forcefully when, um, when communal tensions are invoked. And I think this is a fundamental responsibility of democratic leadership. I think it's one um, that will continue to test us, uh, all of our, our democracies in the years ahead, but I'm confident that it is one that um, both the US and India can meet um, with pride. I think we should. Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. Sorry, ma'am, I'm to disappoint you. And some more. My apologies for that. Well, uh, the fact is that radicalization is a subject which is worrying everybody. It is the biggest threat which everybody is confronted with. Uh, it is also a fact that there are people who are in this kind of an organization uh, who are beyond reasoning. They don't understand reasoning because they are motivated to that degree, are indoctrinated to that degree, right. that they are beyond reason. They will not follow. And uh, each country is uh, confronted with a threat of a different uh, level. Uh, yet, uh, even though we may have different levels of threats, yet the uh, common sense would dictate that uh, the entire world unites together to face this problem together and perhaps evolve a common strategy. Uh, that perhaps may be more. Uh, pain. So this is a subject one can keep discussing and I must uh, congratulate our uh, speaker of the day. She's done a marvelously good job in giving her viewpoint and we thank you very much, uh, Dr. So, and uh, once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to give her a very warm round of applause.